Hi, everybody. Um, today I'm excited to continue the discussion that many started about power in the classroom um, and also how power manifests in classrooms and discourses, resistance to power, and so on and so forth. Foucault has written pretty extensively, as many of us know, about power in discourse. And um, rather than saying that power is located in one entity or one system or one institution, or one person, that there's more of an ebb and flow to power, a, a sort of back and forth and an always ongoing process um, between power within and on institutions, systems, and the these bodies, etc. Um, Deanna Fassett and John Warren have really done what I think is a very productive and helpful uh, the labor of taking what Foucault started and putting it into the context of the classroom. And their work has really helped me think differently about the ways that I both enact and feel a sense of a pawnness about power in the classroom through my language use, the ways that I move my body in the classroom, the ways that I ask students to do the same thing. Um, and so that's what I'd like to talk a little bit about today. And I want to start with an example. Um, one of my friends and colleagues showed me his kindergarten report card. I guess it wasn't so much I have it here, a report card, as what they called, here it is right here, my, um, my, my progress in kindergarten, it says. Um, now, take a look at it right here. Now, folks in critical pedagogy and other sorts of what I be, I'll be reductively um, call radical pedagogy, so engaged pedagogy, queer pedagogy, feminist pedagogy, and so on. Um, well, they've written about the hidden curriculum, and as McLaren describes this, this is um, the unintended outcomes of the schooling process. And so I, what really struck me about this report card um, is the ways that policing the body was part of the hidden curriculum for many of us as early as kindergarten, but probably even before. So let me show you. Let me show you some examples here. So if you look at um, some of these, I know it's pretty difficult to see, um, but some of them say things like, um, I play well with others and I'm a good sport. I'm courteous and considerate of others. I accept and respect authority. Let's see, this one here says, um, I work without disturbing others. I follow safety rules. I keep reasonably neat and clean. I rest quietly. Um, I'm acceptive of constructive criticism. I listen. What is this one? I listen. Over here. I listen while others speak. I obey school rules and these sorts of things. Um, now, during the discussion that I had with my friend, and I'll leave this up here for a little bit, even though you can't quite see it so well, that we found that both of us have specific memories um, and early memories of our bodies being policed. We both tended to be quick with our own work, and so we'd often get out of our desks so that we could go help them with their work and talk with them, and so on and so forth. Um, both of us were reprimanded for doing so and for moving about the classroom, for building these connections with other people, for engaging in what we now know is a very effective technique of peer-to-peer -peer learning and teaching. Now, upon entering grad school, I was taken back to my own kindergarten days and remembering how much I, I just really enjoyed sitting in those round tables with all the little chairs around it. You know, we didn't sit in our own desks. We sat with one another. We learned from one another for the most part, or at least maybe that was the purpose of it. And those chairs easily pushed in and out for those sanctioned times when we could bustle about the classroom finding books to read or markers to create art. Now, I remembered that when we were to get in trouble for something like that, we were, um, we were told to go to what we might consider to be a regular sort of desk with that hard wooden top on it and then the metal underneath where you could put your books. This was um, a, a place where we could no longer share in the learning space with our peers because we weren't sitting around that table anymore. We couldn't make eye contact with them. Now that regular desk was really meant to be an isolation for the kindergartner near do wells But that very next year, when we were in first grade, and all the way up through some college courses even, that desk that was meant to isolate and punish somehow morphed into what became the place that learning was supposed to really happen. Because now you're a big kid and you get your own desk. 
Um, but that hidden curriculum surfaced and meaningful in some really hurtful ways because the isolation that I used to experience for punishment in kindergarten became an everyday isolation for me and it is for most students within the U.S. educational system, I think. Um, it was really a manifestation of the regulation of my body in the classroom. So talking with my peers now became grounds for punishment. Getting out of that desk, um, moving that desk, doing anything out of turn were schooled into me as behaviors deserving of punishment. And so the relationship no longer mattered. That connection that we could make with our peers sitting around the table no longer mattered, and it never would again until many, many years later. The space of the body in the classroom in those sorts of contexts were really all but removed. Now, more current arenas, I think power plays itself out in what seem to be a bit more complex and complicated ways when we think about college classrooms. I feel for myself in college classrooms, I'm pretty fully aware of my body for all of its privilege um, and as such for all of the ways that it really does embody and enact power upon others. So, for example, performances of my white skin, my wedding ring, um, my ability to be in front of the classroom, in front of the classroom without having to ask. But I'm also aware of the ways that it feels an external sense of power really moving through my body and being written upon it. Some examples of that are um, when I'm sitting in a desk or standing next to a student. You can't really tell on here, but for those of you who know me, you know I'm, I'm about five feet tall and I'm probably exaggerating a little bit there. So I'm often in circles of infantilizing discourse because of this. I, I hear all the time, how tall are you? Um, I feel so tall when I'm around you. You're just so cute because you're little. And to be honest, that's really hurtful to me, in part because it's disarming to me. Um, I don't quite know what to do with it. I feel really uncomfortable and powerless in those moments. I try to be fully aware of students' bodies, too, for how they enact power, which I'll talk about in a little bit. I believe in power sharing in the classroom, but there's a caveat to this. I believe in it always with the understanding that power sharing depends upon both parties being willing to engage in that sharing. Um, in a classroom, also being reflexive enough to realize that I'll always have a sanctioned sort of institutionalized power that students are likely to never have. And so those are both meaningful contexts to think about the power that maybe I do have. Now I can invite students into power sharing, but they don't have quite the same privilege as me. So in those moments where I think I feel really powerless, those moments where a student standing next to me asking about a grade, um, the moments when we're seated in a circle and my feet kind of awkwardly dangle on the floor without quite touching it, those moments where I can't erase on the board what the previous instructor left because it's too high or I can't pull the projector down because I can't reach the screen, those are the moments where I'm most aware of competing discourses of power, particularly as those um, are enacted upon my body and, and I enact them through my body. I'm the institutional power with the charge of teaching. The student's charge is for learning. Though I feel distracted by the power that the students have to judge me in that moment and to infantilize me in that moment. Likewise, those moments where I'm asked by students to enact the institutional power I'm given as a result of the privilege I have because I have this advanced degree. For example, the moment where a student raises, um, raises her his hand to go to the bathroom, where um, they make eye contact only with me and not with other students in the classroom. Um, moments where they may have to ask other students for help in moving desks so they can get their wheelchair into the classroom. In those sorts of moments, I'm also aware of the competing discourses, that I'm the institutional power with the ability to either affirm or, um, or disconfirm or deny their bodies in the classrooms. Um, I can deny the gaze of their eyes. I can say, only look at me because I'm giving you the grade. I can literally deny the physical access they have to the classroom by just even shutting the door and saying, don't come in yet. Um, and the complexity is even increased even more when we consider the power that uh, the power that students have, for example, to pack their bags up and leave at any time, um, the power to say no, the power that they have to police one another. 
And so let me tell you a secret. <laughs> when students are standing up, maybe if it's during an activity, um, maybe at the end of class when they're coming to ask me something, maybe because they're, they're standing up and showing something during class discussion instead of saying it from their desks, I almost always try to be sitting down. And I'm not always very proud of that choice. Um, I try to stand as far away as possible without it seeming too socially awkward. Contradictory as it may seem, these are the ways that I perhaps, perhaps unself-reflexively, unwilling to put my body on the line, feel compelled to hold on to power. Because I know that I don't just have it, they have it too. I really feel a sense of that ebb and flow of power that Foucault talks about and that Facet and Warren put into the context of the classroom. Um, I feel it every day. I sense it every day. And one of the easiest, not easiest, but one of the most compelling ways I can think of to really interrogate that ebb and flow of power in the classroom is to make it part of our course content. And I don't think we do that just because we're in communication studies, but that is something that is a phenomenon of all classrooms. And so because it's a phenomenon of all classrooms, it seems to me that it can and should be interrogated in every topic and, and in every content area. So I thank you for listening to my contribution to this critical praxis, specifically on the theme of power, resistance, discourse in the body. Um, I hope it's been helpful, and I really appreciate the opportunity to have this outlet um, to speak about this issue. Thanks.